Well, hey, gang, what is a crack -a And I want to get you going on the second part of our study of imperialism, the March of the Flag, part two, America emerging as a world power. Let's have a look at the map and see how we have changed from the beginning of the 19th century to the end. Now, as you have a look at this map, Consider that most historians consider 1898 to be a major turning point in American diplomatic and military history. And that is because, for the first time, we have become a major overseas empire, planting the flag across the planet in places like Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, etc. The Pacific Empire was largely the work of the Republican administration under William McKinley, whose policy of benevolent assimilation was to teach and to train and to uplift other peoples, supposedly uh, inferior peoples, and make them ready for self-government. You recall that was his justification for annexing the Philippines, was that, well, we need to train these people and make them ready to be more like us. He gave a speech in 1900 in which he laid out what he believed the, the, the fruits of imperialism had brought. He says, there has been a reunion of the people around the holy altar consecrated to country newly sanctified by common sacrifices. The followers of Grant and Lee have fought under the same flag and fallen for the same fate. Party lines have loosened and ties of union have been strengthened. Sectionalism has disappeared and fraternity has been rooted in the hearts of the American people. And so he's saying here that well, this has been a good nation-building experience, not only for people abroad, but for the American people themselves. Sectionalism, remember the Civil War, North and South, had divided us for so long, and William McKinley here is asserting that North and South have come together under a new cause and for a new national purpose. He goes on, political passion has altogether expired and patriotism glows with unextinguishable fervor in the home of in in every home of the land the flag the american flag has been sustained on distant seas and islands by the men of all parties and sections and creeds and races and nationalities and its stars are only those of radiant hope to the remote people over whom it floats. Now, pay attention to that. He is saying that the people like the Philippines, the Filipinos, or people in Cuba, or people in Guam, or Wake Island, etc., uh, for, for them, the presence of the American armies and the presence of the American commercial enterprises are symbols of radiant hope. And he says, the mission of the United States is one of benevolent assimilation. That is, we are here to make the rest of the world a little bit more like us. We are here to prepare and equip the world for Republican self-government. This is the purpose of the United States. Well, by the turn of the century, one of the theaters of commercial expansion was China. Now, China had always considered herself the Middle Kingdom, the center of the world, the most important culture on the planet. But by 1799, this self-image was really no longer sustainable. The Middle Kingdom, so to speak, had been horribly weakened by internal disunion and then the foreign wars, namely the um, Opium Wars, conducted by Great Britain. And so what began to happen is the great powers of Europe, England, France, Germany, Russia, and the Asian nation Japan carved up China into informal economic spheres of influence, meaning they decided amongst themselves that this would be the center of our commercial operations and this would be the center of your commercial operations. And who was not consulted, of course, was China. So here's a political cartoon showing China in the center, sort of the slain dragon, and then all of the predatory um, countries gathering around her all wanting a piece of her. There's Russia the bear, there's Germany the hawk, there's England the lion, uh, Japan the jaguar, and so on. 
Well, this political cartoon shows the Chinese pie being carved up by the great powers, England, Germany, Russia, France, Japan. And you may ask, well, who's missing? Who's not at the table? Who's not getting their piece? It's the United States. Well, the United States doesn't like being cut out of the commercial operations in the East. And so to correct the situation, John Hay, who is the Secretary of State under William McKinley, makes it a pretty uh, audacious claim. It's called the Open Door Policy of 1899. Now, it's not official legislation. It's nothing that Congress has to vote on. It's simply something that he says. He says, we're going to have an open door policy. And this is how it reads. The United States urges all nations claiming a sphere of influence in China to declare that all nations shall enjoy perfect equality of treatment for their commerce and navigation within such spheres. So he's asking for a uh, uh, an open uh, freedom of the trade, so to speak, freedom of commerce within China. Let's not preference one nation over another or have these spheres of influ influence for one nation and not another. Let's have everybody competing equally inside of China. He goes on, the policy of the government of the United States is to seek a solution which may bring about permanent safety and peace to China, preserve Chinese territorial and administration, administrative entity, protect all rights guaranteed to friendly powers by treaty and international law, and safeguard for the whole world the principle of equal and impartial trade with all parts of the Chinese empire. So he seems to be speaking on behalf of China. We're here to preserve traditional Chinese territorial and administrative entity. But in fact, this is a statement saying China will be open Open to us and it will be just as open to us as any other European nation and so he's sort of uh, maintaining the fiction of Chinese independence where what he's saying is we're going to have a piece of Chinese um, commercial influence in other words America has no interest in colonies in China but it will not tolerate being banned from Chinese markets the open door in China is essential to giving American businesses what they need to prosper. So let's underscore that point again. One of the primary purposes of imperialism is to open up foreign markets, to buy and to sell and to use the foreign resources of other countries. And from the American perspective, this is only a good thing. Here's a political cartoon showing Uncle Sam stepping onto the world stage right onto China. And, of course, he's holding in his hand the trade treaty with China, the open door policy. And have a look at everybody who has suddenly uh, dropped to their knees in deference to Uncle Sam. The British are there. Um, the Italians are there. The Russians are there. And they all have their... Um, their scissors in their hand because they were going to chop up China and take a piece for themselves. And here's the U.S. stepping in and saying, no, no one shall cut up China. It's going to be equal for, for everyone. We're not going to have so-called spheres of influence. Well, as I said, the open door policy maintains the fiction of a free and independent China, but the reality is this is the United States telling China and telling the European powers how things are going to be. Well, the Chinese really have no interest in the open door policy. Remember, this is a closed off society that never has really wanted a whole lot to do with the rest of the planet. And so a, uh, a nativist revolt within China um, out, breaks out in 1900 called the Boxer Rebellion. And the caption of this cartoon reads, when all of the last foreign devils, that is the Europeans and the Americans, are expelled to the very last man, the Great Qing, united together will be will bring peace to this our land well it's a, a very hopeful sentiment but it does not turn out that way for the chinese the americans and the british and other european powers join forces in order to put down the boxer rebellion and keep china quote open for european and american commerce much to the displeasure of the boxers who tried to expel all foreign influence
You will recall that William McKinley ran for a second term as president in 1899-1900 uh, and was re-elected to that second term with Theodore Roosevelt as his running mate. Well, he is not going to serve out the majority of that term because he's assassinated on September 14th, 1901 by a disgruntled anarchist. And that means that the Republicans' worst nightmare is coming true. That's right. Theodore Roosevelt is now going to assume the presidency of the United States. And as um, McKinley's campaign manager, Mark Hanna, declares, now that damn cowboy is president. Well, nevertheless, that damn cowboy is in the White House. He is sitting in the Oval Office, and he's going to be making decisions regarding U.S. foreign policy. TR is going to call his approach to foreign policy big stick diplomacy. And it works very much the same way that he exercised the use of the big stick with domestic affairs. He's not going to get loud. He's not going to get boisterous. He's not going to slam his fists on the table and tell you what to do. He's simply going to display American military might and the American military and naval power and use that as a platform from which to make demands. So for TR, the American military should be the instrument of our foreign policy goals. We do not pursue things or make demands unless we have the military might to back it up. Now, TR also believed that the U.S. has a duty, as Rudyard Kipling would believe, and as his predecessor, William McKinley, believed, to civilize other nations. He believed in benevolent assimilation, and it's the, the United States' job to impose democracy and his ideas of freedom on the rest of the world. Inferior nations, and that would at this time include the Philippines and it would cl include Cuba, do not have a right to self-government, according to TR. And so they're going to have to fall under a period of tutelage to the United States or to a European nation before they gain that right. So here's a couple of cartoons that demonstrate this. This is the world's constable. You can read it at the bottom. And there's TR standing um, sort of, you know, from his place in the United States, uh, stride the planet there, and he's wielding the big stick. It's called uh, the New Diplomacy. And then you've got another one here with TR is wandering around the Caribbean, and he's got his big stick there. So he's going to tell the rest of the world what to do, and he's dragging the um, what is going to be called the Great White Fleet with him. Now, how TR is going to put his money where his mouth is, so to speak, is through the use of his great white fleet. This is his pet project. 16 gleaming white battleships that he is going to send around the world on a uh, supposedly a good world tour to various ports of call, primarily through Asia. And what he means to do is, is wave hello to all of his neighbors in the global community, but what he's actually doing is demonstrating America's newborn naval power and strength and telling the, the world, essentially, the United States is a force to be reckoned with. Now, in order for TR's big stick diplomacy to work, he recognizes the need for a canal so that he can quickly dispatch uh, ships with troops on them to any point in the globe. You see, the Great White Fleet, in order to make an impact, has to be dispatched quickly. The U.S. has possessions in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and getting from one side to the other takes... 16,000 miles and 68 days. So if some crisis were to occur on the other side of where the, sh of where the fleet was, it would take a while to respond. So this is obviously not going to be acceptable. The U.S., says TR, needs a canal through Central America that will cut that trip to 6,500 miles in just 20 days. But where are we going to build this? Such a canal does not exist. Such a waterway has been eluding explorers ever since the days of Christopher Columbus. How are we going to make this happen? So the Roosevelt administ administration decides that the Isthmus of Panama looks pretty good. It's a suitable spot to build a canal that would connect the uh, two oceans, Pacific and the Atlantic. It's a 10-mile strip of land. 
It's low-lying and swampy, so although it would be very ambitious, it would not be out of the question. This is the era of epic canal building. These uh, efforts are going on across the globe. But the problem is that it belongs to the sovereign nation of Colombia. And when Colombia decides or, or, or when Colombia figures out that the United States is bent on building this canal, it immediately raises the price that it would at least to any nation that's deciding to undergo such a project. Well, Teddy Roosevelt says, I want the canal built anyway. And so for him, this is not going to be a problem. And he's going to come up with a very creative way to deal with uh, the difficult Colombians. So the way that TR is going to solve this problem is by making a deal with Panamanian rebels. These are people who would like to be independent of the nation state of Colombia, but they don't have the manpower or the resources or the army to do it. And so he basically offers them $100,000 if they will start a revolution against their um, supposed you know, overlord Colombia. Uh, so then he's going to send the Great White Fleet to block Colombia's entrance into the Isthmus while the Panamanians declare and carry on their revolution. So step three is have that revolution. Write a constitution, declare ourselves independent of Colombia, let's do it. And step four is to recognize the independent Panama and then start negotiating a new canal treaty. So this is a very heavy-handed way of dealing with a company or a country that does not want to uh, negotiate on TR's terms. Again, this is a big stick diplomacy. Look, you're going to deal with us on our terms or we're going to make things happen and we're going to do it through military power. So here's a political cartoon. There you've got TR himself building the canal, which is, uh, you know, not too far from the truth. And he's shoveling dirt on Bogota, which, of course, is the capital city of Colombia. And what does the, the caption say below? Panama, a new sister republic. Now, uh, at this point, I would like you to turn away from my YouTube video and watch another YouTube video. It's a 10-minute documentary on the construction of the Panama Canal, but it's definitely worth looking at. Now, wait, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to turn away. How many questions could he really give me on the, uh, the viewing check when I watch this? Um, how about a hundred? I'll give you a hundred questions on the video on the Panama Canal. And just to sweeten the deal, this will this will do it for you. I know you're going to turn and want to do it now. This documentary is hosted by TV's Leonard Nimoy. That's right. Get started. Well, as you saw in the video, and you did watch the video, one of the biggest problems that the canal builders are going to fight is disease. Panama lies within the tropics. If you look at the map, that's a spot that's very favorable uh, breeding ground for mosquitoes and then all of the little diseases, the viruses that the mosquitoes carry. Disease had been the main killer in the Spanish-American War. It had killed more soldiers than combat. And with uh, 5,000 canal workers dying of various diseases every year during construction, this is a problem that's going to need to be solved. I love the political cartoon. It says the first mountain to be moved, and we're looking at yellow fever. Uh, in 1906, for example, 85% of the workers had to be hospitalized at some point. Dr. Walter Reed um, he identifies the mosquito as the culprit, as the carrier of the virus that spreads yellow fever. But how do you stop a disease that's spread by a bug that lives in water? And again, what are you doing? You're building a canal. You can't really get away from this problem, can you? Well, to solve the problem, the canal builders declare an all-out war on mosquitoes. You're looking at a picture, a picture of the unfortunately named Dr. William Gorgeous, who orders all swamps drained, he orders the excess vegetation cut down, and he orders all standing water to be sprayed with oil, and this will keep the... Um, 
the mosquito larvae from uh, finding a favorable place and from hatching. And believe it or not, all of these efforts work. Death rates fall by 90% by 1910. And canal building is able to continue at a pace that it ha had not previously been able to do. And so this is what the Panama Canal looks like today. That 10 mile strip has been cut and it does link the Atlantic to the Pacific allowing plenty of commerce, plenty of ships to uh, enter and exit every single day. The Originally the United States had a lease on the canal for 99 years, uh, but President Jimmy Carter um, signed another lease in 1977 which gave control, uh, ownership of the Panama Canal to the Panamanian government and we peacefully transferred power to the canal in 2000. But for TR, he got what he wanted. He was able to link the um, Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean and allow the Great White Fleet to move easily from one spot to another. So you can see the route before the canal would take a really long time, and the route after the canal is going to shorten that route by quite a bit. So let's look at the expansion of foreign policy under TR. Remember back when James Monroe had issued his Monroe Doctrine in 1823, essentially stating that the Western Hemisphere is off limits to any further European colonization. And he had done this uh, rather soon after the War of 1812, historically speaking, uh, realizing that he was going to need the British to back him up. And it was uh, a rather bold move on his part. Well, TR gives it teeth in 1903, and without the approval of Congress and without the approval of anybody, really, he declares the Roosevelt Corollary. Says, in the case of chronic wrongdoing by a Latin, by a Latin American nation, the United States is going to assume the, the role of world police. That is, we will intervene and we will restore order. And essentially what, he, what he's not doing is he's not shaking his fist at Latin America and saying, um, you guys better behave. He is shaking his fist at Europe and he is saying, you guys will not intervene if there is ever any reason to do so. Any default on loans, any uh, upstart revolutions, anything that threatens the balance of power in Latin America, this is the prerogative of the United States not of Europe. And he says, this is uh, chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in general loosening of the ties of civilized society may in America as elsewhere ultimately require the intervention of by some civilized nation. So there he's talking in that language of social Darwinism again, the assumption being that Latin American nations are not civilized and may require the intervention of someone who is. And in the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence to, exercise, to the exercise of an international police power. Oftentimes we hear that, you know, oh, it's the United States acting as the world police again. And we sometimes say that rather flippantly. And, you know, we're almost a little bit ashamed of that sometimes, like it's not our job to police the nation. Well, in 1904, in the State of the Union, when TR made this a reality, um, he very much in intended for the United States to act as an international police power. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is not legislation. This is not something that Congress met upon and said, yes, this is going to be our job. This is TR acting unilaterally with the force of his own uh, personality to make this Roosevelt corollary a reality. So this is the cartoon that explains exactly what he's doing. And if you see TR, there he is, dressed up as the world's police. He's flinging around his big stick. It's titled The New Diplomacy. And down at the bottom, I'll just highlight, for, highlight that for you, the world's constable, which means the world's policeman. This is the role that the United States is now taking on under the Roosevelt Corollary.
So let's back up and take another look at our two progressive presidents. Of course, there's three main progressive presidents, T.R., Taft, and Wilson. So in 1908, you have William, William Howard Taft, who is T.R.'s successor, and he is going to be uh, the president until the election of 1912. And in 1912, you're going to see the emergence of Woodrow Wilson, a far more progressive president than Taft was. Now, they're also, they're both of them are, of course, going to be taking on the trusts and they're going to be taking on the major progressive issues of the day. But, of course, both of them also have to deal with foreign policy. And we're going to have a look now at how the progressive presidents deal with foreign policy. We saw TR. Now let's go to William Howard Taft. Taft's approach to foreign policy is not big stick diplomacy. He calls his dollar diplomacy. So instead of throwing around our armies, he says, let's throw around our economy. The purpose of dollar diplomacy is to say that the U.S. should invest in foreign countries in order to increase influence. American dollars should, sh should control foreign corporations, and American dollars should be at work employing foreign workers. And so when a political crisis arises, the problem can be met with our economy, with our dollar power and our purchasing power, not our guns. So William Howard Taft says the diplomacy of the present administration has sought to respond to modern ideas of commercial intercourse. This policy has been characterized as, and this is uh, my italics, substituting dollars for bullets. It is one that appeals alike to idealistic humanitarian sentiments, to the dictates of sound policy and strategy, and to legitimate commercial aims. So the idea is if the United States wants to see a um, certain course of action taken by a Latin American country, the best way to do that is not to throw our armies around. Nobody's going to make any uh, friends that way. The best way to do it is to control their economies. So we say, for example, to uh, Honduras or to Mexico or some other Latin American nation, you're not going to act a way that it's favorable in the, to the United States. Well, that's very interesting considering we have so much invested in your country. What would happen if we were to leave? What would happen if we were to find other customers? That's a lot of jobs your country would lose. And the idea is they would acquiesce to our demands. So let's illustrate this point by looking at U.S. interests in Latin America over time. So this is not just dealing with the Taft presidency, but also just looking at the entire uh, progressive era um, over time. So we'll start with exports to Latin America. In 1880, we had just $64 million worth of exports to Latin America. But one year after Taft left office, we had moved up to $348 million in exports to Latin America. Investment in Latin America, we had 0.308 billion in 1887, and look at this, this moves up to 1.6 billion two years after Taft has left office, and on the eve of the Great Depression, $5.2 billion of investment in Latin America. Also, take a look at U.S. goods as a percentage of a country's total imports. This will tell you how much a country's economy is dependent on American manufacturing or American agriculture or other industries in the United States. So we'll start with Mexico. Mexico in 1914 was dependent on on the United States for 50% of its total imports. This means that the United States more or less owns certain um, industries in Mexico. And Take a look at Central and South America. I know it's very difficult to generalize, but as a whole, up to 65% of Central and South America is more or less owned by U.S. corporations, which are importing uh, consumer goods and other goods into those countries. Take a look at Venezuela. We're looking at 40%. So this is a really huge amount. When you think about how many people are going to be dependent uh, for their jobs and their livelihood on U.S. imports, this is one way that we can control their politics. We can control elections this way. We can control the outcome of uh, major public policies because U.S. corporations are so heavily invested in their economies. Uh, Brazil? 
15%. So not an overwhelming amount, but nevertheless, 15% of the total imports are controlled by the United States. Go to U.S. businesses expanding abroad in the 20th century. Let's have a look at a few. Let's look at mining, oil, and agriculture. You've got some household names such as uh, Kennecott, Braden, and Anaconda in oil. You've got Sinclair, Standard Oil of California. In agriculture, you've got the United Fruit Company. All of these have expanded major operations into Central and South America during the Progressive Era. So once again, dollar diplomacy is a way to attempt to control a nation's public policy, not through invasion, not through guns, but with dollars. So the idea is invest in the infrastructure and development of a developing nation, and then you turn that nation into your customers. You dominate an industry and you hire local people. And when election time comes around, they're going to look north to the United States and they're going to say, what does corporate America want? This is how we're voting because this is how we are going to keep our jobs and this is how we're going to keep our economy moving. That nation's employment and hence its economy is dependent on its continued U.S. investment, dollar diplomacy. Well, the progressive president, Woodrow Wilson, has an altogether different approach, at least in theory, from his predecessors, William Howard Taft's dollar diplomacy and from TR's big stick diplomacy. Wilson calls his approach moral diplomacy. You see, Woodrow Wilson was a huge critic of the imperialism of the Republican Party. And so as a Democrat, he's going to say, we're not going to toss our armies around. We're not going to overrule the consent of the governed across the globe. I condemn these sorts of approaches. I want to spread peace and democracy by example, not through uh, imposition of guns and armies or dollars. He says the U.S. should work with other nations as equals and promote human rights, national integrity, and economic opportunity. He says, we must prove ourselves, that is, Latin America's friends and champions, upon terms of equality and honor. We must show ourselves friends by comprehending their interest, whether it squares with our own interest or not. Comprehension must be in the soil in which shall grow all the fruits of friendship. I mean the development of constitutional liberty in all in the world. So whereas Wilson uh, believes with his predecessors, T.R. and Taft, that the United States had an obligation to the rest of the so-called uncivilized world, his approach is not to send in the guns or not to take over their economies, but to provide a moral example and thereby direct the development of the so-called less developed people in that way. Now, despite Woodrow Wilson's high-minded idealism, he is going to have some of the toughest diplomatic challenges of the three progressive presidents. Of course, he's going to have to deal with World War I, but before that, he's got to deal with unrest in Mexico. The Mexican dictator, Porfirio Diaz, had run his country in a way that had enriched the few, that is the businessmen and the military, but had left most in poverty. And this is partly in consequence of Taft's dollar diplomacy. U.S. imports made up half of Mexico's total imports. And so the, the Mexican economy was dependent on the good graces of U.S. corporations, who controlled, more or less, the economic outlook in Mexico. And so in 1911, Francisco Madero leads a revolution that topples Diaz and establishes a reformist or much more left-leaning regime. Now, in 1913, you get yet another phase of this revolution in which the militarist, the right wing, Victoriano Huerta, assassinates Madero and seizes control. And he promises that he will protect American interests. He's not going to attack um, dollar diplomacy, so to speak. And of course, he's trying to appeal to the Wilson administration, which was elected in 1912. 
and say, no worries, our revolution is of absolutely no threat to U.S. corporations, so please leave us alone, right? Everybody see through that rhetoric? Wilson is not at all impressed by the new regime's promise to protect American interests. Declaring, I will not accept a government of butchers, Wilson denounces the overthrow and instead supports a more reformist and left-leaning Venustiano Carranza. Well, I will teach Mexico to elect good men, he declares. This is his moral diplomacy. Now, Woodrow Wilson is facing some of the same problems that William McKinley faced with his supposed inaction. One Republican congressman declares Wilson's foreign policy is characterized by weakness, uncertainty, vacillation, and, un and uncontrollable desire to intermeddle in Mexican affairs. He has not had the courage to go into Mexico, nor the courage to stay out. I would either go into Mexico and pacify the country, or I would keep my hands entirely out of Mexico. If we are too proud to fight, we should be too, too proud to quarrel. I would not choose between murderers. As is so often the case, it is an international crisis that provokes presidents to action or gives them license to action as was the case with the explosion of the USS Maine in Havana in 1898. Well when American sailors are arrested at the seaport of Tampico on April 14, 1914, Woodrow Wilson looks at the situation as an opportunity to intervene. Now President Huerta apologizes and realizing what uh, what uh, the uh, the Mexicans have done, and he releases everybody right away. So sorry, didn't mean to upset you. But Woodrow Wilson has the crisis that he needs, and he uses the occasion to invade Mexico, sending in the Marines and going after Huerta, staging a coup and overthrowing the Mexican government. So there is President Huerta. The Marines force him from office. So he is out. And Woodrow Wilson's guy, the more left-leaning, the more reformist, the more idealist Carranza, is in. At this point, Pancho Villa, a former Carranza supporter, disapproves of Wilson's heavy-handedness. You cannot just march into our country overthrow one president and put in somebody that you prefer even if it's somebody that I like. So Pancho Villa uses the opportunity to invade the United States, that's right, and he attacks at Columbus, New Mexico. Eighteen Americans are killed by Villa's men. Villa continues to hold the distinction of being the only person to invade the United States until the September 11th attacks. Wilson decides to take action. In March of 1916, he dispatched General John J. Pershing on a punitive mission to capture Pancho Villa and bring him to American justice. He chases Villa for months before he gives up the chase. Villa continues to be the only person to invade the U.S. until the Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda attacks of uh, 2001. But who's paying attention to these events anyway? The United States tossing around its armies, sending them into Mexico, and really angering a lot of Mexicans at the process? Germany's paying attention. See, this is 1916, and for two years, Germany has been engaged in uh, a war that we'll hear about in a minute. We we'll call it the Great War, and today we refer to it as World War I. They're fighting a brutal two-front war in Europe against France, England, and Russia. And they could really use another ally. <laughs> 